to the very first episode of Accessibility. I'm Grace McGuire. And I'm Will Tier. Accessibility is a show where we dig deeper into the topics that affect people with all abilities in all walks of life. We will start our show a little closer to home. Our first story is about a group of students on Quinnipiac's campus who have taken on a mission to create a more open and understanding environment for the school's autistic students and faculty. I was working at a school where all the students had, some were all neuroatypical in some form or another, and some were even wheelchair bound with some sort of neuroatypical condition. I fell in love with like the community, how it worked. So what I want to do with the club now is kind of take their passion, which is common to all schools like that, and I want to bring it to Quinnipiac. I actually told Evan a story about how my brother has autism and how I related directly to that. and. He also felt, uh, felt very passionate about the topic as well. My mom actually is a special education teacher in our school district, so she had kind of worked with students like that before, so she knew how to handle it. Um, one of the biggest things that I had noticed um, is the way that my brother was acting at, with this diagnosis was different than the student, how the students my mom had were acting, and that kind of sparked an interest in me because um, I don't think that many people understand that autism spectrum, spectrum disorder comes with a bunch of different characteristics and they can be in different levels of severity and in different aspects of their life altogether. And I think that that is very important for people to understand. That was our idea with this group is that we need to educate people on how, on the different aspects of it. Cause you do, you do understand what people say about autism spectrum disorder, you know, like the basics of it, but people don't really dive into the different characteristics and the different severities that do come along with it. Um, I think a lot, of t a lot of times, you know, we go to a small school, a lot of people know, everyone knows each other for the most part, but, you know, you hear things, and people tend to know the students that are neuroatypical, and sometimes you hear not great things that, that uh, neurotypical students are saying, you know, because they don't understand. It, it's simple as that. I would like to see everyone care a little bit more and kind of put themselves in the shoes of others and understand what exactly they're going through and how life for them may be different than we are than we experience and support them throughout these academic and um, extracurricular endeavors. One thing that I'd really like to see happen is, I gotta stop hearing the R word. I, I think that people use the word because they are uneducated about the fact of what that word entails and they use it in a, a derogatory way. And I think that educating people more and making people more aware of the situations that these um, particular individuals go through will help hopefully um, deteriorate the use of the R word altogether. We want to have a lot of events um, cater around speakers and then we also want to do fundraising. So in the greater New Haven area and Connecticut as a whole there's tons of really cool organizations that are doing a lot of really good stuff that are very similar to what we want to be doing. I think that that's good to have Quinnipiac as an affiliation of supporting our community as a whole rather than just looking at the students here we're also looking at the individuals with this developmental disorder that are outside of our community, so within the um, region. Wow, what a great initiative, Grace. Definitely. It's awesome to see Quinnipiac students taking the steps to make the campus more inclusive. Oh, absolutely. And next up, we have a piece on dancer Faye Jones. Faye is a person who leaves through life with an incredible positive attitude. Local music is definitely uh, the, the music that I like to dance to because um, I can feel the emotion and, and it, um, it's those kind, that, that kind of music, it makes me feel that I'm in that moment. I, can, I know how to work, I can know how to dance to that. I, been, I was dancing since, um, I did ballet since I was seven. Um, so from that on, just kept on dancing. I've been there for 20 years at the Civic. I did several um, d different classes in the Civic. I did jazz. I did, um, I think, tap. My favorite part about it is, um, well, one thing is a stress relief um, thing. And also, um, there's, there's some music that can speak to me because of uh, things that gone with my life and stuff like that. That's kind of my my little thing that I just if someone's letting me down, I try to dance 
and that just keep me not in that negative way. Dancing is basically it's a good it's a good thing for for everyone to do. Um, doesn't matter who you are, and it's um it's a great way to express your feelings. I was in the People magazine with my with my ballet class with my ballet class. It's the title is a chance to dance, and that um. That was in the People magazine uh, back in 2009, and um, it um, it's um, been great. It has been I forget how many years now, but um, we got that, and then um, I did a talent show back in Jamaica, and um, and everybody loved me. Um, and um, it's just that's the way that I wanna. Um, that's the thing that I just wanna share to everyone who has special needs or non-special needs. Just continue. Just continue with your passion. I wanna be a professional dancer um, because that was my lifetime dream to be a professional dancer. Nowadays, I'm just writing books. Um, because I want to, I want to be a special special needs author, um, to um, um, to make pe people with special needs to be aware that someone with special needs who is actually trying trying to do different things that I can do. Um, I want to get my books out and um, I want I want, I'm famous for dance and everything, but I want to be famous in the in another form, like my English, for my English, um, I want to be, um, to branch out a bit, um, for my, for my books and just be an author and let people be my books. Faye is such an inspiring woman. I couldn't agree more. Coming up after the break, our own Dave Stevens is with us in the studio with some special guests to talk about the issue of COVID-19 and vaccine accessibility. 21 years ago, Jonathan Sweeney's life changed forever. He went into a coma not knowing he would become a medical mystery. Fast forward 20-something years, he is now a Quinnipiac alumnus. Jonathan was diagnosed with a rare condition only 20 people in the world have, and he's ready to talk about it. Each week, Jonathan explores new topics with medical conditions, his lifestyle, and living with an invisible illness. Season 2 of One of 20 Podcast, coming this fall. For me, it's about taking a vision or concept that exists solely in the imagination and making it a reality. Whether it's a music video, a still portrait, or anything in between, people have visions of what they wish to see, and it's up to me to bring those visions to life. I'm Will Ryan with Will Ryan Media, and if there's a camera involved, I'm the one for the job. Welcome back! And now let's turn it over to Dave Stevens at the Accessibility Roundtable. Dave and his guests will discuss the challenges of scheduling and receiving the COVID vaccine during this critical time. Dave? Thanks, Grace and Will, and uh, let's get right to the topic. It's very near and dear to my heart, and it's also near and dear to our guests and our panelists today. And uh, first, let me introduce Elena Galan, who is a Quinnipiac graduate and also the star of the television show Smothered. Uh, Elena has been... Uh, dealing with a disease called MPS-6 all her entire life, and we'll get into that a little bit. And Of course, we're joined by her mother, Marcia Galan, who has also been a big part of what we're going to talk about, and that's trying to find uh, the best way to explain what people with disabilities have gone through. And our third panelist is Deborah Dorfman, who is the Executive Director of the Disability Rights of Connecticut. And we're just going to talk about what we've been through, some of the experiences. Uh, Debbie's going to help kind of clarify some of the things that we may, we may not be ready. But uh, Elena, tell us a little bit about what your struggles that you went through when you were trying to get the vaccine yeah. for this dreaded virus. Well, it's been a huge struggle um, trying to get the, an appointment. I also had a huge surgery coming up, 
So I was really scared and nervous um, what, it would, what would happen to me if I didn't get um, the vaccine and if I caught COVID. Um, with, my, with living with MPS, I know I'm at higher risk. And so I knew probably if I got COVID, I would die. And so when I tried to get an appointment at the Westchester County Center, um, I got an appointment, but then they would, they told me, nope, you can't get it because you don't fit the requirements. And so it just really made me wonder, like, not even just about me, but everybody else who has life-threatening illnesses or diseases, um, how this could impact their life. And Marcia, you went through that as an apparent where, mm. you know, your biggest struggle is to provide for your child. And Correct. you showed up that day. And tell us a little bit, you had people that, really shouldn't have turned you away. We had uh, letters from doctors because I prepared myself as usual to have um, whatever documentation if there were any issues and she had letters from the doctor and from her s upcoming uh, surgeon stating that she needed the vaccine. It, it, you know, it was really um, necessary at that point she was going into a hospital and I was scared it was like a lion going you know a human going into a lion's uh, den um, unpro you know unprotected and so when we got there um, I went up to the window she was in a wheelchair actually and they said nope sorry you can't you can't come in and it was like why we have an appointment it doesn't matter she didn't fit the the um, qualifications um, at the, at that time and it was it was really so upsetting um i was so angry and shocked um um, but the better side of me said just to walk away because she she was having surgery and I didn't want to go to jail that day. Hmm. Um, but it was it was it wasn't funny and um, it, it was a, a terrible experience. And um, like Elena said, it made you really wonder where the priorities in this were. I was willing to give up my vaccine. I said I'll I'll give her mine, and it would no they wouldn't do it. And you know. People think people with disabilities or handicaps have this golden ticket and that we are always first in line and have the best parking spots. And in this case, that wasn't the case. And Debbie, yeah. we're not here to pick on anybody, but you were an advocate to help people. And I know you went through a lot, both sides, where people wanted to attack you, yet you're trying to help people. What did you go through during this when everybody said, oh, let's get this to the people that need it first? Well, um, unfortunately, you know, um, the the disability community um, was really left out in the prioritization as, as you know, <laughs> clearly um, has been illustrated. And we at Disability Rights um, Connecticut, um, along with our um, other community partners have been advocating um, since really since the decision by the governor not to prioritize people with disabilities and underlying medical conditions um, in, in the uh, rollout of the vaccine, we've been involved in advocating. We were hoping that the government would change its mind and come up with a process that would prioritize people. Um, we didn't create a situation where older adults weren't able to get the vaccine, but we wanted to make sure that um, access to the vaccine for people with disabilities and underlying conditions was equitable and that they had an opportunity. We have been um, you know, really inundated with calls from people, um, you know, uh, like Alana, who have not been able to get their uh, vaccines because of the way the, the governor's policy has been rolled out. And many of them need medical uh, treatment or surgery and aren't able to get it because of not been able to get the vaccine. And even as um, things have opened up in the sense of like age restrictions. The problem is, is there's not one uniform process um, that is across the state that allows people equitable access, but then that puts people who really need it right away. And for people who it's really a life or death matter at the back of the line. Well, at least we've gotten to the point where you've had it, I've had it, we're all in a good place. But uh, something I noticed when I went to get mine, again, the accessibility isn't taken in consideration at these places too. The exit, the entrance, the things that I had to go through where people could walk upstairs, things like that. Mm -hmm. Did you go through any of these kind of things in your situations as far as the access for you? Well, actually, shockingly, they had a ramp. 
so they were all prepared for yeah, that and prepared. they had a good system going and you actually entered a bigger room if you had a wheelchair or something so they were very accessible and accommodating um, but I've seen other places where they're just not accommodating at all and you're like D does anybody even think about it and yeah. Marsha we are not here to fix the problem in the past, but if we can fix it in the future, do you have any thoughts to what we could do next time, something in a situation like this, where people with disabilities are kind of put in last instead of getting to the front of the line? People with uh, differences or people with challenges really need to be the speakers and empower themselves because they can do the most, I believe, um, of anybody um, <clears throat> and, and get things really where they need to be. The more visible you are, the more outspoken you are. You know, I, th <laughs> I think it's just, you know, the more people that have the confidence and the stamina and, and also um, just the the uh, courage to get up and speak out um, will be the best um, hope that, that things can change in the future. Deborah, as we wrap up, what can we do better in the future to help those afflicted and to get this medicine into their hands, like having portable transportation to get, like we do with food services? Why can't we do those kind of things going forward? Well, certainly, there's a lot of different things that can be done, and actually, that's one of the things that Disability Rights Connecticut will be working actively to provide advocacy to help people have access to the vaccine. So, and that's um, including um, making um, having the physical facilities accessible, but also making sure that people who, for example, who may be deaf or hard of hearing, have um, effective communication, so they know how to get the the vaccine and are um, able to go to where they need to go. And that information is being provided on site when the, where the vaccines are. Um, and also having um, you know, the information out there so people who do need accommodations can actually request them and know where to go to request them. So education is key. And um, we're gonna be deeply part of that and also part of the advocacy. All right, Deborah Dorfman, thanks for joining us. Marsha Elena, thank you. Best of luck in thank the future. Uh, we didn't fix it, but we did talk about yeah. what we can do to do better. So uh, hopefully in the future, we all have the opportunity to get what everybody else deserves. And uh, best of luck to everybody in the future. Grace and Will, back to you guys. Welcome back. We now have something special for you. Reporters Alicia Brancato and Alessandra Veron take a ride up to Massachusetts to follow a story of resilience in the face of unexpected challenges. Here's the story. I remember skating across the red line, skating across the blue line, kind of going after the puck. And as a forward, I guess technically I was pretty far out of position, but I, again, I wanted to do something. And as I went to grab the puck behind the net, um, it bounced off my stick off the boards and came back between my feet. And at that time I looked down, uh, felt a player converge on me. We collided. I ended up losing my footing, went headfirst into the boards. One of the first things you're taught in hockey is that when you get hit, you get back up, you get back in the play. Um, so I sent that message to my body. My body didn't move. Um, panicked a little bit, sent the message again. Um, again, my body didn't move. At that moment, I think my body became kind of overwhelmed and I kind of just blacked out. When 15-year-old Matt Brown arrived at the hockey rink that day, he had no idea how much one check could change his life. I remember kind of coming back to um, one of my good, good friends' mom was kind of in my face trying to, you know, cut off my chin strap. I looked around and there were a lot of feet on the um, ice. I saw a couple of EMTs. Um, I remember them talking me through that you know, the ambulance is going to be here soon. Just kind of calm down, slow your breathing. And it just felt like I was being suffocated by just thousands of pounds of wet concrete. And it was dead, dead quiet. You could hear a pin drop when I was on the ice. And when I got wheeled off, kind of the crowd erupted. And all I wanted to do was give the thumbs up or put my hand up and just to say thanks. And I tried and I tried and I tried. Um, but nothing happened. And when he got to the hospital, he found out exactly what had happened to him. I suffered uh, a spinal cord injury at the C4 and C5 a cervical vertebrae. So up in my neck, um, uh, paralysis from 
both the shoulders down. I, I'm lucky. I, I, I have feeling that almost the entire body, which um, it, it's not what it used to be. Um, I, I have feeling that you know some others might not have. Some might have more. You know, every spinal cord injury is different. Um, so normally that would mean you know no movement uh, below the shoulders. Um, I, I can wiggle a few fingers. I can actually uh, wiggle my right toes. Um, so what's funny is that you know there's a message getting from my brain through the injury and all the way out to my toes. What's frustrating is that that message doesn't want to wake anything else up on the way down. Um, but it, it's letting us know that there's a uh, that there's a message getting down. And um, now it's just about you know working hard and hopefully one day you know th that message starts to wake up other parts of the body. Brown was resilient from the beginning, but it wasn't always easy. So I got hurt halfway through sophomore year. That first week, I asked why a lot. You know, why me? Why did this happen to me? What did I do to deserve this? And I think the hardest part was, you know, slowing down and realizing that I'm going to need help with almost everything I do. And it took me a little bit, but I figured out and realized that asking for help was okay. I quickly realized though that I had so many people behind me, family and friends in the town that um, I kind of, you know, it was then that I set a goal that I'm going to work as hard as I can for as long as it takes to beat this and you know, get out of here. Um, and over the last years, that goal hasn't wavered, but it's changed to the point where, you know, I'm going to enjoy life as much as I can. Um, um, still going to work as hard as I can, but I'm not going to let these years go to waste. You know, when I graduated high school, I had no idea what the future was going to hold. Um, I, I knew that I wanted to go to, wanted to, go to college. Um, I fell in love with Stonehill growing up, uh, and they opened their arms um, and said, whatever you need, we'll figure it out. Those first three weeks, I thought I made the wrong decision um, to the point where I really thought about, you know, I'm not going to be able to do this. I was really nervous that there was no way I could see myself lasting the first semester, let alone the first year, and no chance I was going to do the whole all four years. But he did. And after graduating college, Brown continued to push himself to accomplish great things. I met my co-author, Todd Sibben, in, in 2011. And I was like, you know, you should, you should write a book, you should write a book. Flattered, I said, that's awesome, but you know, I'm not ready yet. It's a couple months, a couple, a year and a half after I got hurt. And then finally, senior year, senior spring, I gave the book a thought, and I really thought about it that spring. And I wrote, I scram, I just rambled and rambled on Microsoft Word for about 35 pages of just stories, memories, what the book would look like, how it would flow. And I sent Todd a message, you know, three weeks after graduation and said, I'm, I'm ready. I sent him what I had and, and he got back to me and said, this is how you write a book. After almost three years of writing, Brown's book, Line Change, was published in March 2019. It's one of the things I'm most proud of. Um, having, we wrote it for, you know, in our minds, the 14 to 25 year olds, kids going through high school, middle school, college. Um, facing the everyday adversities, but we've gotten message from parents in their 40s, 50s, and 60s, um, friends of my parents, um, older people that have found messages in the book to connect with, and uh, so that that's been extremely, extremely rewarding. I'm still getting messages from people that have read it and um, that have even taken the time to read it. Uh, means more than they understand. Brown's mission to make a difference did not end with his book. I launched the foundation, uh, the Matt Brown Foundation, officially this past June. It's been difficult trying to start a foundation in the middle of a pandemic, but I'm learning a lot um, uh, and we're really gearing up for a uh, for big 2021, hopefully. Without you know the Travis Roy Foundation and the Boston Bruins Foundation, all, all that they did you know, for me with, with my first wheelchair, with my first accessible van, um, it, without them, it, it would have been a long, long road for us. And, you know, since having that help um, throughout this journey, you know, I've, you've heard that I've been so lucky with the support I've gotten. But over the last 11 years, we've seen individuals and families facing the same stuff that we did, same challenges that we did, 
with, with no support. And we know how important support is. So for us to you know, create this foundation and to be there the way that the Travis Roy Foundation and Thomas E. Smith Foundation and Boston Bruins Foundation are there for me, you know, now we get to give back and be those for someone else. Not only has Brown launched his own foundation, but in addition to accepting donations, he has also found a great way to raise money for it on his own. My running partner came over one day and you know, I asked, would Matt ever want to do the, uh, would you ever want to do the Boston Marathon? And I said yes, before I even knew how it was going to work. And we've raised money for multiple um, other groups. So now, you know, to be able to do it with, you know, a team of your own, to raise money for my own foundation, is, is going to be one of the coolest things ever. Like everyone, Matt Brown has rough days, but he never lets go of his positive mindset. So our motto that we've kind of, that we've come up with is never quit. You know, there were, there have been times that I thought I, I've hit my wall, I've hit my threshold, um, but it's never quit. And that's, you can be going through something as traumatic as a spinal cord injury. You could have a bad. You could be having a bad day at work. You could be having a bad day at home. Um, a bad day at school. But it's never quit because you know there's light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and, and, and never be afraid to you know lean on others when times get tough and surround yourself with good friends and you know, be there for others when they need it. For Ability Media, I'm Alessandra Veron. What a powerful message! Never quit. It's when you can really make your own, no matter who you are. Definitely. To buy Matt's book, Line Change, go to his website, mattbrown3.com. And to donate to the Matt Brown Foundation, visit mattbrownfoundation.org. I know I'll be on there after the show. Yep, nope, me too. And I can't imagine a better note to end our show on. Huge thanks to everyone who helped put our pilot show together. This has been Accessibility, brought to you by Ability Media. Media for everybody. Please make sure to follow Ability Media on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and check out our website, abilitymediagroup.com. Thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you next time on Accessibility.